Thank you, everyone, um, for coming. You know, I know that the exhibitor hall has just recently opened, so a lot of folks are uh, going out and collecting that uh, very high-value uh, merchandise. Um, so I do appreciate you taking the chance to uh, be here um, this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, and so obviously, as what the title slide says here, um, you know, kind of in this hour and a half um, workshop slash presentation, um, we're going to kind of talk about a little bit of an interesting topic here, um, kind of deploying your own um, converged HPC system within an hour and 30 minutes, uh, hopefully. So, all right, let's see if the control's working here. Eh, we'll click that. All right, sweet. Um, so before we get started here, um, something that I like to do for every presentation is that you know, I love to give, uh, or I like to give myself a bit of an introduction, you know, kind of familiarize yourself of who's speaking to you, and also, you know, kind of talk a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Jason Tzinucironi, um, and I am an HPC engineer at Canonical. Um, and if you kind of look at the little uh, subtext at the bottom there, um, I am one of the not-so-ancient elders of Ubuntu HPC. And so if you don't know exactly what that is, um, we are a relatively new um, community team um, within Ubuntu. Um, coming up on our one year birthday here. Um, and so basically what originally started is just like a couple of folks just you know out and about in the community who are kind of focused on the supercomputing aspect of using the Ubuntu operating system. Um, after one of the, uh, or the 2022 um, Ubuntu Summit, um, we decided to get together and we formed a community team together. And so there is one thing um, that I want to say about this presentation, and what it is, is that unfortunately, folks, I am a terrible um, procrastinator. And so what do I mean by that? So unfortunately, the text is very small, but I'll uh, read it aloud for you. Um, I have received this email um, that says that, hey, I know that you have your workshop today, um, and but I need you to uh, analyze this data set and hand the results in at 4 p.m. And unfortunately, this workshop ends at 4 p.m. So, um, you know, in order for my uh, colleague here to be able to present um, the results of my analysis um, at the vendor meeting, that is conveniently right at the end of my uh, talk here, um, better get started um, with that. So obviously, you might, you know, kind of look at the GIF on the screen, and, you know, if you get, like, a very tight deadline, um, so to say, uh, you might be sitting, feeling what is in a burning house and saying, this is fine. But actually, everything can be OK. So um, you know, you heard about this uh, cool up and coming open source project, and maybe being a little <laughs> stretch here. Um, but it's OK, you know, because we can leverage this project to help us do our analysis in an hour and a half. So um, you know, and this project's name is Charmed HPC. And so if you're kind of wondering, like, you know, a new name here, Charmed HPC, what exactly is this? Um, I have some logos um, kind of on the stage right here, presented on the uh, stage right of the side of the screen, um, that kind of demonstrate some of the various components that are at play here. Um, and we'll kind of get to see them just a little bit um, as we kind of go through um, this workshop slash presentation. Um, so kind of in the uh, top corner there, um, you'll see Juju. Um, Juju is a kind of lifecycle operations manager. So you can kind of think it somewhat like Ansible with like config management, but Juju kind of goes to the next step where it also manages other application um, lifecycle events, such as like say configuration, um, application destruction. Um, it can also handle different kinds of events. So for example, let's say you have like an LDAP server and you want to be able to like mount that um, across or you want to be able to connect to that, um, you would be able to like handle an event when like, hey, the LDAP server is here or there's been an update to the LDAP server. Um, or you can also, you know, handle when the LDAP server departs. And so then kind of then in the bottom corner there, um, what you'll see is just a couple of different logos. So for example, you'll see like OpenStack, you'll see LXD. A um, little bit smaller there, you'll see some of the more popular public clouds, such as like Mi Microsoft Azure, um, GCP, um, AWS. Um, and essentially what that signifies is like the kind of cloud um, backing provider. So that's, you know, figure you have virtual machines, you need to be able to request machines. Um, these services would be what provides that service. Um, and then in the top corner, that's a little bit closer to the center of the screen, um, you'll see various different kind of packaging technologies. Um, so we kind of have the most two obvious for Ubuntu. Um, we have uh, Debian packages, traditional ones. We also have Snaps as well. Um, there are certain components that leverage um, Snap technology. And then there's another little interesting one um, that's kind of right underneath those. Um, that is the SPAC package manager. Um, I did hear some folks come in earlier and talk a little bit about Nix. Um, I could say that... Uh, <laughs> Heard somebody laugh. But um, SPAC is kind of similar like that, but also not. Um, it kind of 
what it does is it enables like users to be able to install packages um, within their own kind of namespace without really having to you know have root access. So you could think like on a traditional like Debian or Ubuntu system, if you want to um, install a package, you would do like sudo apt install, um, and then obviously you need root privileges. But you know if you're one of a user of a thousands on kind of or a tenant on a system where you don't have root access, you can't just willy nilly install debs or snaps as you want. And so the SPAC project um, is a lot more helpful for that. And so, you know, it's really advanced. Um, it kind of uses a lot of advanced logic under the hood to basically enable you to specify compiler versions, pass very specific flags. Um, you're able to install it in like environments similar to like virtual M's or uh, Conda. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty useful tool. And the last uh, thing that I kind of want to call out is what's uh, the logo that's in the um, bottom center. Um, that's a fishbowl. And so the fishbowl kind of represents like the greater Ubuntu community. Um, and so basically, a lot of different stakeholders um, come into um, Ubuntu HPC. They all bring different perspectives. They all bring different challenges. Um, and what really helps um, in this aspect is that you know they can kind of be able to present use cases that I might not necessarily thought of. Like, hey, we have this requirement um, or something else like that. And so then, you know, you take that smorgasbord of technologies and you equivalent them together, and you get Charmed HPC. So now you're like, oh, great, we have a potential solution to help address our challenges. But wait, what is Charmed HPC? So I just kind of showed you a slide um, that had some logos and maybe painted a bit of a nebulous picture of what it specifically is. Um, but now if I navigate to the next slide, um, what we have here um, is just kind of a overall diagram that outlines the overall architecture of exactly what Charmed HPC is. And it's kind of in a nutshell, there's a lot of very um, different components in it. And so what this diagram seeks to do is kind of help simplify it a little bit more. Um, and so kind of walking through what this, uh, all these components specifically are, um, if you look at kind of stage right um, there, your left, um, you'll see SSH. And so currently in Charmed HPC, um, I did give a talk yesterday about, say, like open on demand. Um, but currently, right now, the traditional way to access our system is through using like the SSH protocol. So you could think like PuTTY. You could just think your like typical terminal um, or any other client. Um, at that point, to which you'll then go into a login slash head node. So that's kind of the staging area where users can go into the cluster, you know, those multi-tenant users, um, and be able to kind of do manipulations, you know, write job scripts, um, analyze data, you know, download results, that stuff. Um, and then that picture that's in the bottom there, um, that's very much like a terminal. So that's kind of the expected interface right now. And then from that point, um, kind of progressing closer to me on the stage here, um, the next part, kind of with the log in node, what the user integrates with, um, they go into the Job scheduler. So in our case with Charmed HPC, um, we use this uh, scheduling program called SLURM. Um, it's an acronym that stands for Simple Linux Utility Resource Manager. Um, kind of more in modern times, they prefer it's called the SLURM Workload Manager. Um, if you're wondering why the name SLURM, um, it is based off of the SLURM drink from episode 10 of season one of Futurama. So I guess somebody really liked the show, and they were like, we need to name this thing, and they chose SLURM. So now after the user kind of interacts with Slurm, um, typically their primary interaction will be with Slurm CTLD, which is the control daemon. They'll go ahead and submit their job up. Um, and at that point, um, Slurm is very much responsible for figuring out where to schedule um, the workload on one of the various you know, partitions of nodes that we have. Um, so you'll see here, you know, kind of like closest to me, um, you'll have like compute A, compute B, and compute C. Um, and then they're kind of divided into partitions. And with that, um, they're a lot more heterogeneous in kind of what they can have. And so, for example, what you'll see here is kind of a couple, a few icons. One is like the SPAC package manager. So, for example, that could be available to users um, when they're setting up workloads and whatnot. They'll be able to compile packages and install them. Um, there's also like a little one there. It's a little, seems like maybe a bit of a web. Um, that's to kind of represent like InfiniBand networking. Um, typically on HPC systems, they have um, network cards that are a lot faster than, say, the standard Ethernet that you would have in your laptop. Um, and then also just GPUs. So now that we've looked at the compute nodes, um, I want to take some time to then kind of look at the other auxiliary services that kind of compose Charmed HPC. Um, so if you look at the bottom center there, um, the first one you'll see is kind of storage. Like, um, and in that case, what storage is is that it you know, provides data storage for the cluster. And so currently, um, 
you know, what we uh, support is uh, NFS and Ceph um, as different implementations. So if you're doing like a smaller cluster deployment, you know, people like the joke that the N and NFS stands for no performance, which is kind of true. Um, we can use that to basically make data available everywhere in the cluster. So somebody said went into like the login head node um, or maybe even the control node to figure out what's going on. Um, they'd be able to see all their files. And then when they submit jobs, all those files would be, you know, consistently available across the cluster. So let's say you have a program that runs on two separate nodes but needs to access the same data set um, using that parallel storage implementation. Um, both those nodes be able to access um, the data. And so now, above storage, um, what you'll see there is LDAP. Um, so in most uh, HPC clusters, basically how they make sure that workloads work is that users all exist as the same on each of the nodes. So if I'm like, you know, user 1001 on um, compute A, um, I should be user 1001 on compute B as well. Um, and that's basically how you make sure that you don't get issues of where people are accessing data that they shouldn't be accessing um, or, you know, trying to escalate privileges or anything like that. So that's why we use LDAP. Now, if you look at the top center, um, what you'll see is MySQL um, or MySQL. Um, I don't know how people specifically say it. Um, but typically for that, um, what that is providing is like an accounting daemon. So if you basically want to be able to collect metrics to see, you know, how much users are utilizing their clusters or doing anything like that, um, most of that data will be proxied in via like a database service into MySQL. And at which that point, you know, somebody's like, hey, you know, are we oversubscribing the cluster or is somebody using more resources than they really should be? Um, you'll be able to kind of execute queries against that uh, MySQL instance. And then right next to MySQL, um, you'll see COS. Um, that's basically an acronym for the Canonical Observability Stack. Um, it's just basically something that's designed and developed by Canonical to provide observability metrics into your cluster. Um, and so effectively what that is is uh, composed of multiple services, like, say, Grafana or Prometheus. And then the idea is that, like, you know, if you want to see dashboards to get into the overall health of your cluster, um, you'll be able to kind of log into one of those endpoints. And the last thing that we have here um, is an example of like the backing cloud. That is what will provide the machines to kind of run all these different services. Um, and so in this case, what I'm showing here is Metal as a Service. Um, so basically, we're able to request um, physical resources on demand and then use that to kind of provision and structure our cluster. So then, you know, kind of what that diagram showed you was a very potentially high-level overview um, of what the system looked like. And so what this one is kind of trying to do is maybe give like a little bit more granular, simplified view um, of everything that's going on um, and break down the various different um, services and daemons um, that are involved. Um, so the first thing um, kind of that I want to call out is what's in the center of the screen. Um, so you have resource management. If you look at that, um, that's kind of composes of, say, what Slurm is. So if you look inside that box and then to the far left or stage right, um, you'll see Slurm CTLD. And what Slurm CTLD does is that it is the Slurm control service. Um, and so basically what it's responsible for is intaking user job requests and all that, um, doing the accounting and understanding where to schedule the jobs. So for example, I could say, oh, you know, I want a node that has uh, 288 cores with, you know, a terabyte of memory. Um, and I want it to have a H100 GPU attached, potentially, um, or something like that. Um, and then Slurm, the scheduler, would be responsible for kind of going out, finding what resources are available, and then putting that job there, and then tracking that until it's completed. And so then what you'll also see is those uh, Slurm D services that are in there as well. Um, and what that is is that it is the compute um, daemons. Um, those are mostly responsible for kind of taking requests in from Slurm CTLD. So Slurm CTLD is like, hey, run this process on yourself. SlurmD is the one that is responsible for kind of taking that in, kicking it off the process, and then what it'll do is that it'll actually drop privileges um, and assign to that process the user's effective ID and group ID so that if you were to go on that node, it would look like it was being run by that user specifically and it wasn't actually started by Slurm. And so those two will kind of feed back. Um, and then basically what they both have um, mounted or available on them is an NFS client and a triple SD. Um, triple SD is basically how you're able to communicate with the LDAP server, and then the NFS client is how you are able to successfully mount the NFS share. And so now, uh, kind of going further into what the other services are, um, the one thing that we have, if you look closest to me, is that we have the NFS proxy and the NFS server. Um, essentially what those are is that we could have maybe, say, some podunk or bespoke uh, NFS server implementation, and what the NFS proxy is then responsible for um, is taking in like the address or information about the NFS server and then making that available to all the clients. 
And then for identity, um, right now, what we're using is GLAuth. Um, that's effectively providing an LDAP implementation um, for identity. So now, um, if we then go to the stage right or your far left, um, what you'll see here is like Slurm RESTD. Um, that's one way of potentially accessing the cluster. Um, it's basically a REST API for submitting jobs. So rather than saying going through your terminal or shell, um, you can make a HTTP request. And then we just have the accounting database that's just mostly responsible for understanding um, overall usage. Um, and so then with Slurm DBD, um, that's specifically the daemon that's responsible for that. Um, and then using a MySQL router, then it's able to successfully communicate with the MySQL instance and then kind of put that information in there for later retrieval. So now you might be saying that, you know, that I've received this email from my colleague saying that I need to do this analysis. Now we have to ask ourselves, so how can we use a charmed HPC cluster to solve our problem and finish the analysis in time? And so looking at that, um, we can start by deploying one. So this is kind of where now the commands part plays into this part of the presentation. Um, so if you are interested in following along, um, you can open your laptop um, and type these commands in here. Um, and it basically will just go ahead and walk through um, the kind of setup and installation process. And so if you're interested in following along, um, feel free. Um, you can also take photos um, and then follow along later if that works best for you. Um, or also, this is being recorded as well, um, so you can follow up at a later date if you would like. Mm. So kind of getting started, um, what this, you know, these commands are specifically dedicated for is um, setting up the backing cloud um, to provide the machines. And so what do I mean by machines? I basically just mean like the instances that we use to run the services um, that compose our cluster. So that would be like, you know, where Slurm, what Slurm D runs on, what Slurm CTLD runs on, um, even where set user jobs or like the accounting in uh, MySQL. And so basically why we have this backing cloud um, is that it's able to just basically go request the machine for us on demand based on given constraints and then um, be able to then successfully run the services. So. For our backing cloud, kind of in this example, um, we're using LXD. Um, that's like a container slash virtual machine hypervisor. Um, it uses system containers. So if you don't know or not familiar with um, system containers, um, they're similar to say like Docker applications, but rather than saying like an application process, um, system containers actually have say like system D um, embedded in them. And then you're able to kind of run the myriad of daemons, as I like to say. And then the second command um, underneath that is uh, LXD init auto. And basically what that is is that it provisions a basic instance. Um, and so I guess maybe a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, through this presentation, you can actually deploy the virtualized cluster on your laptop. Um, the idea is to kind of give you an ability to be able to play with it, um, but it is uh, capable of scaling up to um, much larger deployments. And now that we've initialized um, our LXD cluster, um, if you actually go down there, um, LXC uh, network set, um, the bridge um, ad address equals none. Um, that's, that's a bit of an interesting story there. Um, so currently, we're working on adding IPv6 support um, into Charmed HPC. Basically, it was just like a bug from an earlier implementation where we forgot to properly handle um, IPv6 addresses. So for this tutorial, we haven't quite fixed it yet. Um, if you just set it off, that way it'll kind of prevent your cluster from failing to provision just because it's like, ah, I got an address I don't know how to handle. Um, so yeah, that's why we turn that off. And now, um, if you do like say LXD profile set default security privileged equals true, um, the main reason that we have to do that is that LXD containers um, by default um, are not super privileged. Um, and essentially, what ends up happening if you don't have a super privileged container is that you actually fail to be able to mount, say, like NFS into the container because you need to be able to use um, some kernel modules and uh, different features that just aren't available. So by setting security privilege to true, um, that's what enables NFS to work correctly. And so then, kind of on the topic of making NFS work, um, we actually modify the default app armor profile of that instance. Um, and then the idea to help with that um, is that you basically just say, like, hey, if we get an NFS mount, um, allow it through, um, and all that. And then. Last two commands there um, is that we just have sudo snap install juju. So if you remember from the earlier slide that we had there, um, what juju does is it's a lifecycle operations manager for applications. And so eventually, 
as I said, um, it's able to handle like common events that you might have, so like when the application is installed, when the application is configured, um, when it's destroyed, um, and other custom events for like uh, further configuration or integrating with different applications. And then to be able to successfully use um, Juju to provide a cluster, um, we have to do like a Juju bootstrap localhost. Um, and so what's effectively happening there is that Juju is actually deploying a controller um, to your local LXD cloud. And the idea is that with that controller, it's kind of able to communicate with LXD um, and be able to say, hey, I have some nodes or I need some nodes. Um, can you go out and go ahead and get them for me? And so then for the deployment um, continued, um, this is kind of the stage part here where we go ahead and actually deploy the services that will make up our cluster. Um, so we'll have like sudo snap install Pluto Edge. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a bit about what specifically that application is. Um, and then for order for Pluto to behave the way that it needs to, um, you need to do sudo snap connect Pluto juju bin um, and then connect to the Juju bin. Effectively, what that says is that Pluto is now able to access different executables um, provided by Juju. And then lastly, here, to be, in, be able to deploy um, the HPC cloud, um, you just do Pluto bootstrap charmed HPC. Um, and so effectively, what that is is that that goes ahead and initializes the deployment of the HPC cloud. And so now, for Pluto, um, you might specifically be wondering what that is. Um, so Typically, sometimes what I get is like, oh, you know, is it like something to do with like, you know, Pluto, where you have, say, like, you know, a supercomputer deployed on the planet? Um, no, actually, what it is is that it is a um, base simplified script to kind of help take care of some of the nitty gritty configuration details um, of deploying a cluster. So, the reason why I actually added this slide was because um, another time that I did a workshop kind of like this slash presentation, people were like, wait, what's this Pluto thing? You know, is it actually important? Do I need to use it? Um, yes and no. Um, I find that Pluto um, is this little application that I wrote to make it a lot easier for people to be able to deploy the system. And effectively what it does is that it uh, kind of takes away the needing to write um, 60 different bash commands so that everything's kind of integrated and connected correctly. Um, so it does a lot of, it automates a lot of that um, using Python. So for example, um, it deploys the um, Slurm, Slurm workload manager daemons. So if you remember from the diagram earlier, um, that could be like Slurm CTLD, Slurm D, um, Slurm RESTD, and Slurm DBD. Um, it also deploys the back database backend. So it'll go out and retrieve uh, MySQL um, and go set that up. And we'll also deploy a router um, for the MySQL service. Um, after it does that, it will deploy the identity and access management stack. Um, and so what that effectively is, is that it just sets up like LDAP um, and then triple SD services for connecting to that instance on all of those hosts. After that, um, then what it'll do is it'll actually go ahead and then deploy the storage implementation. So it'll go ahead and set up a minimal NFS server um, and provide basically you know, a simple uh, parallel storage implementation. Obviously, there are file systems like Lustre that are dedicated to doing that high performance parallel analysis, but NFS, you know, does the trick in when you need it. And so then, after all those specific applications are deployed, what it goes ahead and does is that it actually integrates all of those HPC um, operators that have been deployed. So it'll go ahead, take care of connecting them. Um, so for example, it'll say like, hey, NFS clients, um, you know, go point to this NFS server and then mount the share kind of at this specified location. Um, it can also say, like, hey, triple SD, this is where the LDAP server is located. Please, you know, connect to that um, and make those users available. Um, it can also then tell SlurmDBD, hey, this is where the MySQL endpoint is. This is how you connect to it. Um, and then for, like, uh, say, like, the Slurm daemons themselves, it can tell um, the control server, um, Slurm CTLD, where all of those um, compute nodes are located and basically store them in inventory for later job scheduling. And so then after that, um, it does a little bit of extra setup. Um, this is kind of something that's a little rough that we're uh, still working on, but what it'll do is that it'll actually go ahead and provision the um, basically a simple test user's um, home directory. So it'll go ahead and set up different paths for them. So it'll set up home, get some files installed, and then that basically that way is that you know if you go inside the cluster, you can already start experimenting as this user. And then what it'll do is that it'll actually go ahead and then activate all the SlurmD compute nodes. Um, and so what it does is that it'll actually um, go turn them all on and let the cluster know, like, hey, you're ready to start scheduling jobs. And then you can log in and get ready to go. So 
The one thing is that it takes a little bit to deploy all these services. Usually when I do it, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, I will say I actually went ahead and did this ahead of time, uh, mostly because I was struggling with the Wi-Fi earlier this week. Um, so I actually have a fully deployed um, cluster on my terminal. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up for you all. Just a little bit of setup here. Okay, making the text bigger so that everyone can read it. Okay, pop over here. F11, maybe that'll help. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Ooh, nope. There we go. And then if I am in here, can I actually? There we go. Sorry, just remembering how to use a computer real quick. There we go. Now let's pop this over. So um, what you'll see up here um, is just basically the um, simple terminal um, window on my computer. Um, if you're wondering why it's uh, Gigan, um, I will say that I am a huge Godzilla fan. So all of my machines are named after the different monsters in Godzilla. Um, and Gigan is like the one space alien that has hooks for hands. And then in one movie, they give him chainsaws. So <laughs> it's very interesting. That was a weird movie. But my phone is actually named Dorat, which is the child of uh, King Ghidorah, the three-headed dragon that is Godzilla's arch nemesis. So just a little fun factoid. I like Godzilla. But so now with that, um, to basically be able to check the status um, of our HPC cluster um, that we've deployed, um, we should just be able to use um, some different Juju commands. Um, so for example, here, Juju, if we do Juju status, enter. Oh, that came out a lot. Let me put that in a pager. Or actually, let me shrink this a bit. That might be a little better. Can you still read that kind of back there a bit? OK, thank you, folks. I appreciate that. So if I do juju status, and then I should be able to just pipe it into less. That should help. So we can page around. There we go. OK. Ooh, that came out a little ugly, but oh well. So um, basically, what you're seeing here, um, I'll just show this part because it kind of was what I want to show, is that it'll actually show the deployment status of all the different applications on the HPC cluster. Um, so for example, here, you'll see that we've deployed a Slurm D application. I've deployed two of them in total. Um, the status is marked as active. Um, effectively, what that means is that, oh, the application is now ready to go to be used by users. Um, and then we have all the different applications that are deployed here. So for example, we have um, GL off, we have the NFS client, we have the NFS server proxy, um, we have the NFS server itself, um, and then a bunch of other services as well. And so if you see kind of in the middle there, that one name Ubuntu, um, that's actually the NFS server. Um, so I just deploy like a little simple test VM and then put the NFS kernel server in there. And then, yeah, it shows like the unit counts, their status, and then basically which channel, which release of the application I pulled. So in this case, like, if you're familiar with, say, Snaps, where if you're on the Edge branch, you're kind of getting latest updates, but you know, no guarantee of stability. Um, but then if you're on Stable, um, usually it's updated less, and it's more um, kind of tested experience, more refined. Um, and then so the same thing kind of exists for the applications that we're deploying through Juju. Um, yeah. So for example, SlurmD, you know, I'm kind of using the development branch as we kind of routinely push out newest updates. Um, and then for like, say, like the Ubuntu base NFS kernel server, we're just using a stable release. And for MySQL and MySQL router, we're just testing out new features and all that. So that's kind of the status window here. Um, and then if I kind of scroll over to the next page here, um, applications can actually show you status messages. Um, typically, if they're active, they won't show you a status message just because you know, you don't want the visual clutter. If everything's good to go, you really just want to see when things are broken. Um, but some of them that we have, they will actually tell you um, how things are going. For, for example, um, for the NFS client, it will show us the status of the NFS share. So it'll say like, oh, it's been mounted at this target directory. Um, so then if you go into the cluster and then you navigate to that directory, it will tell you where NFS is located. Um, and then some of the other applications here will just tell you if like the daemon that's been installed on them um, is available. And say for like NFS server, um, if I scroll over, it's a little bit there, um, but it should be able to tell you, yes, that it's mounted at home. And then the NFS server, sorry, if I scroll over, we'll just tell you that it's like exporting an NFS share. So that way it knows that it's been pre-configured and it's actually working. 
So now if I exit out of that, um, I actually quit, control L. Um, I can actually go ahead and actually log in inside one of these uh, machines. So for example, here, I'm going to pop into the control node. Um, that's effectively going to play as our head node that we would use to access the cluster. We just go ahead and pop in, um, clear that out, and now we're actually logged in. And then if everything went according to plan, I should be able to log in as user researcher. There we go. So now I'm that user. So I'm inside their home directory. Um, and since that's an NFS share, um, I should be able to LS that out. You won't find anything really um, except for a bash history. Um, but why don't we go ahead and create a file here? So I'll do touch uh, or I'll do echo. I'm on an HPC cluster or a mini HPC cluster. And then we'll go ahead and kind of direct that into a file. Test. There we go. If I do an ls, um, you should see that file's there. I can kind of print out its contents. There we go. I'm on a mini HPC cluster. So now if I exit out of this node, um, if the NFS share is working correctly as it should be, um, that file should exist kind of wherever um, that NFS share is mounted. So for example, I can pop into one of my compute nodes. There I am. I'm in here. And then I'm going to log in as user researcher. I'm just using sudo for now to simplify things. Oh, unknown user. Maybe I went in the wrong one. Let's try a compute two. I think I did it wrong. I typed it wrong, that's why. There we go. Cannot change the home directory. Well, it should be under researcher. That might have not just been set up correctly, but go to researcher. Oh, no. Nope. Well, that's fine. We'll do, uh, we'll go back to user Ubuntu because he's also on the NFS share. There we go. Okay, I'll do echo. I'm Ubuntu. Or, oh, sorry. There. Oop, don't want that. Oop. Geez, I need to actually read these before I run them. There we go. I do ls test. Um, I should be able to then now log out, control D, control L, and then juju SSH into a different compute node. Clean that out. And oh, that's not there either. Well, that's unfortunate. We're going to stop doing that. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, unfortunately one little challenge is that since I deployed it last night, I restarted my computer, and so now everything's a little bit messed up. So that's other something that we're working on. But if I go back out here, um, I'll quit that. Pop in. Let me bring my slideshow back. Sorry about that, folks. There. So now after the uh, system's deployed, um, effectively what happens here is that we have a couple of setup commands um, that we go through to help deploy the cluster. Um, generally, it works better when you don't have much faith in the Wi-Fi because follow through. Um, but effectively, um, what's happening here is that we're doing like a Juju exec, um, a Slurm controller, and then a compute agent. And we're just running a couple of typical install couple common packages. So for example, we have like app get install um, build essential. That just brings in like compilers and like a new make and other things that you might want. Um, we also have like Python 3 dev. We install the Python 3 development headers. Um, and then we also do Python 3 um, virtual environments as well. And then we also uh, then SSH into the um, Slurm controller leader. Um, and after that, um, that's kind of when we start setting up our workload here. So then we'll log in as user researcher using that sudo command that I showed you. Um, we'll go ahead and kind of clone a repository that contains the analysis that I have. Um, we'll change into it and then install our dependencies. Um, and then lastly, we'll do like a um, Python 3 um, pip install dash r requirements.txt. So I'll let some folks get some photos of that um, for later. And then 
pretty much after this point, um, what we do is that we actually go ahead and hop onto the queue. Um, so we do like sbatch analysis.batch. Um, if you're wondering specifically what that file is, um, that's just a simple shell script that goes ahead and schedules a job, goes ahead and runs it on the node. And then typically, after that, um, Slurm CTLD will take your job, go run that, um, and then a few seconds later, um, the job should actually complete and return your results. So here, I actually have a pre-made script if you actually clone that repository. Um, and then if you can copy that tar file um, and then copy it into temp and then exit, um, you'll then be able to, using Juju, um, download that off the cluster. Um, so you can do go into leader, um, just copy it off. And then, you know, since it's a tar file, just extract it. And at that point, um, you'll kind of see the results of the analysis. So it's just a couple of graphs, nothing. It was a fake data set, nothing too um, intense. But it'll just be like most popular image. Um, it'll just some new numerical analysis on a data set um, to understand it. So at that point, um, effectively what I want to say for the workshop um, slash presentation. Unfortunately, I was having a lot of issues with the Wi-Fi earlier, and so I didn't want to take everyone through and kind of have a problem where everyone struggles maybe and waits 40 minutes for things to deploy. Um, but I have this QR code here. I'm joining Ubuntu HPC. We are a public group. Um, so I would like to say that when you have better Wi-Fi or you know, maybe an unlimited hotspot, which I unfortunately do not have, um, be great if you could uh, pop into our community and just kind of give us some feedback on how things are working for you. Um, I'd be curious to know um, if you kind of follow the commands um, that I provided here, um, and if you also watch the video later, um, to make sure that everything actually kind of worked as expected for you. Um, it was very valuable feedback, um, obviously, because in a controlled environment where I know what I'm doing, everything works fine. But you know, when you put things in the hands of users, they'll typically quickly find if something is not working. Um, but then also, I just have the URL at the bottom of the page as well, um, if you'd like to navigate. But we are open for contribution. We are open for kind of conversation and future requests and all that. So you know, hit us up today if you're interested. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it for my uh, presentation, folks. Um, you know, once again, sorry about um, having some technical issues there. Um, unfortunately, I was, had a workshop in here beforehand, and they were having, they actually put phones throughout the room that folks could connect to and use their hotspot. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. But yeah, thanks for stopping by, and thanks for listening to me. And have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Oh, come on, I know. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, OK. Who's got the question? We know you all got a question. There we go. Yes. Uh, the Pluto package is like a. It's a way to set up like a mini HPC in your uh, cluster. Is there any? Is there an ability or any plan to make it so you could use that to scale up to like a full uh, HPC cluster? Set that up with all the dependencies required to build out an HPC cluster. Yeah, yeah. So actually, there is a lot of interest. Um, one of our community members has actually made some contributions to it um, recently. Um, to add different integrations. So for example, they actually have a um, front-end workbench that they can use for managing clusters. Um, and they're very interested in what Pluto is capable of doing, where, you know, say, you get kind of the core HPC services. Um, and at that point, then, using Pluto, they can then attach their, say, workbench software. And then at that point, then, you can do more stuff. So yeah, we're definitely interested in scaling it up. Um, I think it's more just like looking at the current implementation and understanding how we can better improve it um, for that kind of usage. But yes, we are, we are looking at it. Hmm. Any other questions? And also, if, uh, if anyone's interested in like, having access to the slides, you know, just feel free to walk up here afterwards. We also have some stickers as well. We have more at the booth. Um, and I'll be happy to send it along and share it with you. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was, that was a good talk. Thank you. <laughs>